Thank you for joining us today. I pray that our time together will help you experience Jesus and to share His grace. We are continuing our Relentless series. We're looking at the book of Hosea and seeing the kind of God that shows His relentless love on His people even when they're unfaithful. This book gives me such hope to know the kind of loving God that we serve. This week we're going to be in Hosea chapter 4 through chapter 6. If you remember from our last couple studies together that Hosea is written in a time when the children of Israel, or they're, they're in the divided kingdom, and the northern kingdom is where Hosea lived, and things were going really well financially, economically, in the time of Hosea. There probably hadn't been a more prosperous time since the time of Solomon. And so things on the outside look very, very good and exciting, but when you look closer, you look inside the heart of the people, you'll see that there was all sorts of unrighteousness, immorality, and most importantly, they had lost their love for God. And so God uses the prophet Hosea to cry out to the people to, to call them back into a deep, meaningful relationship with Him. And so we've already talked about Hosea's personal situation as, as he is trying to mend and reconcile his relationship with his wife, Gomer. Now we go into this, this language where God is trying to reconcile his relationship with his people. And so what we're going to see in Hosea 4 through 6 is simply a put three different things. Number one, we're going to see God's indictment. He's going to, he's, he's, pressing charges uh, in this courtroom imagery against the people of Israel, that they're unfaithful. And then we're going to see the impact that their unfaithfulness has had, and, and to see kind of where it's leading them. Things may look good now, but as it, their sin finds them out, God gives them what they're asking for, and He steps back out of the picture. What is the consequences that's going to happen? And finally, at the end of our time together today, we're going to see the invitation to return back into a loving relationship with God. So we have this indictment, this impact, and finally this invitation to return to a relationship with God. So I want us to read together the first part of Hosea chapter 4, and then we'll unpack it a little and we'll kind of see how it fits the bigger picture. Let's read God's Word together. Hosea chapter 4, starting in verse 1. Hear the word of the Lord, O people of Israel, for the Lord has an indictment against the inhabitants of the land. There is no faithfulness or loyalty and no knowledge of God in the land. Swearing, lying, and murder Stealing and adultery are breaking out. Bloodshed follows bloodshed, and therefore the land mourns, and all who live in it anguish. Together with the wild animals and the birds of the air, even the fish in the sea are perishing. Let no one contend or let no one accuse, for with you is my contention, O priest. You shall stumble by day, the prophet also shall stumble with you by night, and I will destroy your mother. My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge, because you have rejected knowledge. I will reject you from being a priest to me, and since you have forgotten the law of the Lord your God, I will also forget your children. We're going to stop right there as we looked at Hosea chapter 4 verses 1 through 7. So what I want us to look at first off is this indictment that God has for the children of Israel. What is this accusation that God is making against His bride, His people, His wife? And it's pretty clear that it says the Lord has an indictment. This is in verse 1, against the inhabitants of the land. The people who are living in the land that God gave. The people who He has called His beloved children. We see there is no faithfulness or loyalty and no knowledge of God in the land. 
Notice this is the indictment. There's no faithfulness, there's no loyalty, and there's no knowledge of God. Now, I want to focus on this word knowledge particularly because I think it's really interesting. And I, I don't want us to listen to it through our Western ears and our, see it through our Western eyes. I want us to, to see it as the Hebrews would have felt it and, and heard it. What God is calling them to, it says, you have left me. You're unfaithful. You're choosing everything else in the world but me. You're not being loyal. And it says, there is no knowledge of God in the land. Now, I want to stop right there. I want you to recognize that this word knowledge is more than just what you know about something. It actually comes from the Hebrew word that means intimacy, relationship as you might see in a husband and wife situation, this, this interdependence, this intimate knowing. It's more than just knowing trivia about. It's a deep relationship with someone else. So when God says there's no knowledge of God in the land, what he's saying is they might know about me, but they don't have an intimate relationship with me. And I believe this is the biggest indictment that God has for his people. He says, you might know about me, they, they have the writings of law. They, they, they know. The problem is there's no relationship that's dictating their actions. There is nothing in their heart that is, is relying on a relationship with God. Now, you might know about someone, but only an intimate relationship can you live your life dedicated to someone. I want to think about how that every day I make decisions that impact other people in my life. And so I actually have to make decisions with those relationships in mind. For instance, if I'm at the grocery store and I happen to see this type of candy bar that my daughter loves, and I have a little extra cash, and I know that she's had a long day, I will be motivated by my relationship with my daughter to take action to give something to my daughter. Even more simple, have a better way. I get up in the morning and go to work because I have been called by God. I have this great investment in, in the community. But more than that, my decisions are also motivated by my relationships. What happens if I don't go to work, I don't get paid, then my family doesn't have a place to live. So my actions of getting up and going to work are predicated on the fact I have people trusting in me, needing me to, to provide for them. And so I alter my actions based upon my intimate relationships. The problem that's going on in Israel right now is that they have been blessed by God and yet their life is not shifting, reflecting an intimate relationship with the God who has blessed them. They are making decisions based upon their own desires, based upon their own lust, based upon their own pride instead of living a life that would show honor and, and glory to God. Their behavior is not exonerating a relationship with God. There is a hole missing in their hearts because they have rejected this intimate relationship with God at the core of their being, and it is filtering through their actions that they, as it says in verse 2, is affecting everyone else in the nation. It begins with their lack of relationship with God and it spreads to one another. 
their lack of love for God, their lack of intimacy, is an indictment, and it's being proven by the way they're living their life. How are they living their life? Verse 2 explains it. It says, swearing, lying, murder, stealing, and adultery. Bloodshed follows bloodshed. I want to stop right there. Because they do not respect God. They do not respect the image of God in others. And therefore, they're breaking all of the Ten Commandments. <laughs> the, the, the lying, the stealing, the, the not honoring God, and, and even the fact that murder is breaking out because pride has become number one in their life. Their relationship is with their own self. And it's demonstrated by their actions. Their lack of intimacy with God is affecting their relationship with others. And notice it says, violence and bloodshed follows bloodshed. I know that you know the world that we live in. And I know that you've seen the news recently. And you, you hear about the bloodshed. In, in foreign countries and, and in cities all over the nation, how that it just seems that the violence in the world is getting worse. And that all begins with a failure to recognize that we as a as a people don't have a deep, intimate relationship with God because if we did, our behavior would look more like God. So this is the indictment, and this is the problem. Their life looks like trouble. Because in their hearts, there is destruction. Because they don't have knowledge of God. Let's read Hosea chapter 4, verse 6. My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge because you have rejected knowledge. I reject you. So we've already said this knowledge is this intimacy. God's indictment to Israel is the fact that they don't have intimacy with Him. And what is happening is, is their society is slowly destroying itself. It says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. It's not that they don't know what's right in their brain. It's that they don't know and they're not following what's right in their heart because they don't have a relationship with God. And it's because of that they've chosen to push God out of their lives and thus it's being, God is being rejected. Therefore, they are rejecting God. And they're pushing God out of their life. And then when things start to decay and are destroyed, it's only because God has given them what they want. Now, I want to tell you something about my two-year-old. My two-year-old loves juice. I mean, the kid could drink apple juice all day long, 24-7. But, you know, as a loving parent... I have to deny him juice because if I were to give him as much juice as he wanted, if I were to give him as much sugary drinks as he wants, then what's going to happen is his choices are going to lead to the total destruction of his teeth. He might have gotten what he wanted, but in the end it was the demise of something important in his life. So too is it with Israel, because they have rejected the intimacy of God, the relationship with God, then they have chosen destruction over devotion. What about you? What are you choosing in your life today? Are you choosing to spend time with God? Are you choosing... To make time to worship God, to, to walk with God, to, to talk with God, to spend time to build your relationship. 
Because I'm here to tell you it's not good enough to know facts about God. It's not good enough just to even know your Bible. It's great to read your Bible, and I encourage you to read your Bible, but it's not the same thing as knowing and having a relationship with God. That is what God is longing for. He's longing for a relationship with you. You see, from the beginning, Adam and Eve were created perfect in the garden. The, the, the world was, was beautiful paradise. And God would come and He would walk with them and talk with them in the cool of the day. You see, we were created for a relationship with God. Not to, to fear God. Not, not to, to, to shake in anxiety. And we were built, created for an intimate relationship relationship to spend time with God on a daily basis to grow in our love and appreciation with one another and yet when sin entered the picture it separated us from God when you see that in Genesis 3 when when man and woman sin number one it creates separation between themselves their guilt and their shame and they hide from one another and then they collectively hide from God. It separated humanity from divinity. And finally, what we see is that not only were the relationships between man and God and each other affected, but there was also this relationship that was separated, created problems between humanity and the home and the land in which they lived. So when God says, in verse 3, the land mourns the sin of the people. It means that our sin changes our whole world. The, the, our curse of sin creates a curse upon the land. Literally, cosmologically, our sin destroys the earth. And it longs, Scripture says, to be released of the curse that we have brought and continue to bring upon the world. If only we would choose a relationship with God, that intimacy, that, that knowledge, like spending time together. Do you know what I mean? It's not good enough just to have a best friend. It's not good enough to have a spouse. You have to work on relationships. Can I get an amen? You have to invest in time, money. You just have to spend time with people. And, and love them as they deserve to be loved. Serve them as they deserve to be served. Because if you don't do that, you will no longer have a relationship. You know, what's interesting is I, I look at, you know, social media and I see people and I see the relationships and I go, oh, don't they have just the greatest relationship? And, and sometimes we don't know exactly what's going on behind closed doors. I remember reading that uh, someone that I really admired, I just found out that him and his wife had divorced and it just broke my heart that their relationship was torn apart. And I wonder what God thinks when He looks at us when we're fighting amongst ourselves, church fighting church, click fighting click, the body of Christ being divided and ripped apart by disunity, by selfishness and pride, and how we are, are choosing our own selves instead of choosing God. Think about it. In Hosea chapter 4, God makes the indictment. And His indictment is very clear that there is no knowledge, there's no intimacy there's no relationship in Israel. And because of those choices, there are consequences. 
there are always consequences to our actions. We reap what we sow, and there is an impact of this lack of intimacy. In Hosea chapter 5, starting in verse 8, we see this alarm go off. You know, you ever set your, your phone or uh, your alarm clock by your bed and, and you're, you're just about to go asleep and, and then finally that thing just blares really loud and you're like, how did that happen? And it's so annoying. It's just so alarming and just kind of jolts you right out of bed. This is the alarm being sounded in Hosea 5, verse 8. He says, If you choose your pride over a relationship, over intimacy with God, there will be an impact. And here is the alarm. Verse 8, Blow the horn in Gibeah. This is, Sound the trumpet in Ramah. You know, make a noise. Sound the alarm at beth Avon. Ephraim shall become a desolation in the day of punishment. Among the tribes of Israel, I declare what is sure. The princes of Judah have become like those who remove the landmark. On them I will pour out my wrath like water. I mean, this is a very disturbing message. Sound the alarm. Look behind you. The desolation is coming in the day of punishment. It will be as if you were somebody who was a cheat and a swindler. In verse 10, those who remove the ancient landmarks, those who are, who are not honoring the covenant of their community and they're cheating other people. And it says, I will pour out my wrath like water. My kids love to have water fights in the summertime, especially in those hot summer days. And I, I remember just taking a pitcher of water and just pouring out over their head. And, and it's so fun because they're enjoying the time together. And it's a hot day and that water just pours out and totally covers and drenches them. Yet this image of pouring of water is not a pleasant image. Something that is so easily done, just the pouring out of water, it, it totally immerses you, it totally just totally surrounds you. I mean, I was doing dishes the other day, and you know how you turn the sprayer a certain way, and I just got myself drenched by trying to wash the dishes. God says, you're about to be drenched in destruction. And why are you going to be destroyed? Verse 11, Ephraim is oppressed, crushed in judgment, because he was determined to go after vanity. You see, the people of God have chosen anything else, everything else, than decide to have time and to live a life in relationship with God. You see, even time with God smells to the people of Israel like something moldy, something gross. Have you ever opened up the refrigerator and just been smacked in the face by decay? There was one time our freezer had gotten unplugged and we didn't know it and so it sat in the hot sun. The door was slightly ajar and all that decay was just rancid. And I just walked past it and smacked me in the face. It smelled horrendous. I wanted to get away. The image that God is using, that the people of God, it says, Therefore, I am like maggots to Ephraim, and like rottenness to the house of Judah. The, the idea of God, they had gone so far away from a relationship with Him, that the thought of God made them sick to their stomach like that rancid freezer gone bad. You see how our conscience can be seared, how our conscience can be distorted, and how our ultimate fulfillment is a life with God that we become so distracted, we become so wrapped up in a life of sin that even the presence of God seems and feels rancid to us. 
And yet, we see here in, in Hosea chapter 5 that the people smell it and they, they try to address the problem. They recognize that they're sick and God is trying His best to woo the people back into a deep relationship with Him by showing them the rancidness in their own hearts. And yet God wants, despite their horrible hearts, God still wants to invite them in a meaningful relationship. He started with the indictment saying, you know, we have to deal with this. There's unfaithfulness. There's lack of intimacy here. And their lack of intimacy is destroying them and their nation. In fact, judgment is coming. The enemy army is being prepared as we speak. That the indictment it has with it an impact because they've chosen, they've chosen everything else instead of intimacy with God. And this impact is being felt. The consequences of their sin are coming. But despite all that, God wants His people to be with Him in a relationship of love and faithfulness. And so we have at the end of Hosea 5 and the beginning of Hosea 6 this invitation to join God again. Verse 15 of chapter 5 says, I will return again to my place until they acknowledge their guilt. God says, I'm going to, I'm going to give them the consequences of the actions that they have chosen. And it says, then I'm going to step away until they acknowledge their guilt and they seek my face until they want to come back to me. In their distress, then they will beg for my favor. When the crap hits the fan, then they're going to seek God because they're going to recognize all the faulty idols that they had set up, all the things that they had trusted in were in fact lies. And then they might hear my invitation. Chapter 6, verse 1 says, Come, let us return to the Lord, for it is He who is torn, and He will heal us. He has struck down, and He will bind up. And I want you to look at this next verse. I, I, I think it's interesting. After two days He will revive us, and on the third day He will raise us up that we may live before Him. Church, God has an invitation to us today. He wants us to know that our sin is getting in the way of our relationship with Him and that He wants to invite us back despite the consequences, despite our choices. He invites us to come back to Him. And on the third day, He will raise us up. I cannot help but to see Jesus in this image. Because you see, Jesus died for our sins. He was the atoning sacrifice. He was the, the satisfaction. He was the payment of our deeds. And on the third day, He was raised up by the Father because He submitted everything into the Father's hands and God raised Him up. Notice that. That we may live before Him. That we may again come into the presence of God despite our sin, despite the indictment, despite the consequences, the impact that our choices have made. Jesus paid the price. He suffered in our stead. And God on the third day raised Him up so that we can live before Him what was destroyed in the Garden of Eden is now a gift, an invitation into the Garden of Heaven. Verse 3, let us know. Let us know. 
Let us experience that relationship with God. Let us press on to know the Lord. I'm asking you, do you know the Lord? There are people sitting in churches all over the world that do not know, have this intimate relationship with God. They settle for information about God instead of transformation with God. Come, let us know the Lord. His appearing is as sure as the dawn, the rising of the sun. He will come to us like the showers, like the spring rains that the water the earth. You know, right now we've been living in a season of rain where we have desperately needed in Southern California. We have been in a water shortage, a drought. The grass in my yard is still dead from the sun-scorched heat of the day. And yet there comes refreshing with the rains. There comes new life with the outpouring of the water, the precipitation from heaven. And so this image that is as being used is that God's love is like a continuous refreshing rain that the land longs for and needs to heal. And yet, even when we come to the presence of God, God knows that our love is fickle and it's like a morning cloud. It's like a light fog. It's like the dew that goes away early in the morning. You see, God understands that though His love is like a continuous watering rain that, refer that replenishes the land and gives life, He knows that our faithfulness is nothing like a passing breeze, temporary and short. And what God calls us to, we see in, in Hosea 6, verse 6, it says, this is the voice of God saying, for I desire steadfast love and not sacrifice. The knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. You see, what God desires more out of you than anything, it's not your ritual. It's not your sacrifices. It's not the way you do religion. It's the way that you have a relationship with Him and with His people. That's what's on the heart of God. Jesus sums it up as this. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, strength, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You see, it's all about relationship, not ritual, that the God of the heavens and the earth desires. That is the invitation that He is making. Come to me. Have a relationship with me, and I will love you. Warts and all. Church, it's not good enough to recognize that God loves us. It's not, it's not good enough to try to earn our own salvation. What God wants is us to be with Him and to let our actions be determined by our love for Him. You know, I know lots of grandparents that move from state to state to state because of their relationship with their grandchildren. Why in the world would they decide to sell everything they've ever known and move to a different house that, that they, they don't know? You see, their actions are being determined by their relationship. And God is inviting us to, to act on our love for Him by serving and loving others. You see, what Israel had forgotten is that all the blessings they had been given were not to bless themselves, but were to be a blessing to others. You see, they were, they were not to be gods that they put in their heart. They're supposed to be love messages from God. 
to help them see how great God is so that they in turn could love Him more and, and to share more with others, to be a blessing to others. Church, I encourage you to heed the invitation of God. Because I'd much rather hear an invitation of love than an indictment of infidelity. God's not asking you to be perfect. He's asking you to be in a relationship with Him and choose Him first. He's paid a great price so that you might live among Him. Jesus came from heaven to earth for you to show you how much He loves you and to show you how much God the Father loves you. Don't miss this invitation because if you turn your back on this invitation, there might be an indictment coming. But Jesus paid that price so that we might know the Lord. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for wanting and desiring a relationship with us. Father, help us to overcome our weaknesses. Father, may your power come to us and through us, through your spirits, to recognize what we're doing wrong and to be changed by our love for you and that you would give us the power to repent and to live a life based in that love of God. Father, forgive us and thank you for choosing us. Thank you for the invitation. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. I pray that this sermon has been an encouragement to you. It's always good to be reminded that God loves you more than you can ever imagine. Why? Why? not accept that invitation. Be blessed.